I'm delighted to be talking to Eben Bayer, who is one of the, or the central figure in developing the field of mycelium materials. And he's also the, inve the primary inventor on an array of influential patents. So a real shining star in the field. Um, he's also the founder of Ecovative. I keep putting a British spin on the name there, but <laughs> um, which is a New York based company developing mycelium uh, materials and food. So um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, you've been in this field for a really long time. Can you take us back before we talk? Because I know we're going to talk today about scaling up mycelium. Can you take us back to the beginning? I think you said it was 2006 when you kind of stumbled upon the field. What did it look like back then and how did you get into it? Red's good. Red means go. My young children would not <laughs> like this book. Uh, let's see. Uh, I was reminded a lot of some of the beautiful companies I saw in the startup pavilion today that are working out of incubators, uh, working out of basements, and doing biotech in places you wouldn't normally do biotech. But um, I got my start farming in central Vermont. I first saw mycelium there growing up, uh, actually, in our wood piles. Uh, it was a problem for me. Got in the way of bucketing up wood chips. Uh, and later in college, got interested in, like, how could you use this as technology? Uh, that led to the founding of Ecovative, which has been on a 15-year journey to find the highest value, highest purpose uses of mycelium in sort of repairing the natural world and letting humans live in harmony on Spaceship Earth. And the field looks very different today. Can you talk us through what's changed and what Ecovative is working on today? Yeah, so, so just if you can really go in a time machine and imagine it's 2006, the idea of growing things in general, other than like chickens and crops, is, was like a very bizarre idea. The idea of growing whole cloth objects out of mycelium, whether it be insulation or packaging or acoustical panels or whatever, was just like totally bonkers. I remember giving VC pitches and I'm like, we're going to use mushrooms to grow insulation for your, your houses. And they were like, okay. <laughs> And then like, you know, clearly like start looking at the clock and other exits in the room. Uh, since then, there's been an explosion across this sort of environment of growing things. How can we grow single-celled organisms, multicellular organisms? Um, there's a lot of beautiful things you can do with mycelium. Ecovative does some of them. Many other wonderful companies are doing others of them. Um, and I think there's been an awareness on the technical side. So technologists and entrepreneurs are like, whoa, there's low-hanging fruit here. Like, I can build businesses that might make money that capitalists would like, and I can go, go, do good doing it. And I think societally, we're actually seeing this intro, interest, interesting cultural vector of like people becoming interested in like, what are mushrooms? What's mycelium? You know, et cetera. So which, which products are you focusing in on? You mentioned that you're turning more towards food. Yeah. We cut our teeth on industrial materials. So building materials, packaging, um, other high volume, uh, let's call them low profit products. Um, over the last seven years, I got very interested in the impacts of animal agriculture. I, I did grow up farming. I grew up on a beautiful farm in central Vermont. We had like 20 cows, like 50 chickens, 3,500 maple taps. And like, it's a really, it was true sustainable agriculture. Um, and I was kind of blind to ag, like big ag, when I started Ecovative and very focused on plastics. And as I became really aware of the climate impact and then the ethical issues around food, I kind of returned to my roots. And I said, you know, I want to, I want to help the pigs I used to raise. And that led to us creating a pure form of mycelium, which we apply in leather to make really high quality leather-like hides that we then sell to tanners that brands tune into finished products, um, as well as starting My Forest Foods, which is a whole new company that uses Ecovative technology, but it's totally dedicated to making delicious whole cut muscle meat using mycelium with no weird ingredients and just like delighting you. And what stage is, what stage is that at? Uh, My Forest Foods just completed its first factory. Uh, this occupies about 120,000 square feet in upstate New York. Um, it's two giant silos, 70 feet tall, that contain uh, our feedstocks, which is waste wood products. Um, and it'll produce about $20 million of bacon at full clip. Uh, we turned this on in January. We're at about 4% capacity now. Uh, my goal is to be at 100% capacity this time next year. Um, that fat facility also uh, has the first of its kind raw material infrastructure to allow other mushroom farms to grow this new crop, if you will. So, so in some ways we've developed a new crop that can be grown by others. And that will allow us to produce another incremental $40 million of bacon over the coming year without ever putting another factory in the ground. It's impressive. And 
when we chatted before this, you said to me a phrase that stuck with me was that nature can make capitalists a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> can you crystallize the economic opportunity of this field and perhaps how that sits with you? Because Yeah. It, I, so I've been doing this for a long time uh, and it's taken me a long time to get to the realization to really just accept that like we live in a system that is completely controlled by capitalism um, and you can't really fight it or if you're an entrepreneur, you, you really shouldn't be fighting it. And so, you know, I've come to really accept that my job is to make my investors a ton of money at scale because my goal is to take technologies that benefit the planet by scaling to scale. And if you align those two objectives, you can flow a lot of capital, which leads to scale. You know, the trick is that only works if the businesses actually work and the investors that provide large amounts of capital typically uh, are pretty good at figuring that out, though there's some notable advantages, <laughs> uh, examples in the recent years of that not going so well like Theranos. Um, and so I think biology is the hack we have. Biological technology allows us to create factories like our factories. They make clean water vapor, they make clean water, they make compost, make delicious whole cut muscle meat, or they make leather. Uh, and can produce really outsized profits. And that's a good thing, because that starts a flywheel of more of these being built. And so I think when I started, I was, well, Ecovative's entire shareholder base was foundations. And we were funded by grants, and I was very much like mission-oriented. Uh, and I'm still mission-oriented, I just want to like hack capitalism using biology for good. Mm -hmm. I want to get on to the, the funding structure and that journey you've gone through. Um, but first, I want to talk about, because you're building factories, which a lot of venture capital funds and investors are perhaps more accustomed to backing companies that are building software and don't have a kind of real physical infrastructure footprint. Yeah. How has that been? How, how do you set up a factory? How, how do investors feel about it? Um, yeah, it's really a challenge. So we live in a world that is dominated by profits from bits. And like most of what we're discussing at this conference is how do we change the flow of atoms on Spaceship Earth? Um, if you, someone doesn't build stuff, that doesn't happen. Um, in my first life in scaling mushroom packaging, which was the first product we launched, produced worldwide, uh, we designed bespoke factories. Totally new to do this new bioprocess, nothing like them in the world. That was really cool. The downside drag was every time we need to expand, we have to build a new factory. And that has upfront capital costs, it has startup costs, et cetera. And that put a real drag on that model. Um, the factory I just described building actually uses a lot of off-the-shelf components from existing large button mushroom farms. So if you don't know the, the mushroom you probably eat at the supermarket, that little white button mushroom represents 90% of all mushrooms cultivated worldwide. There's 3 billion pounds of asphalt capacity for that. They're all grown in these indoor vertical farms that Dutch have developed over the past 100 years. It's like vertical farming that works. Um, and what we are doing is actually using that infrastructure as comance. There are no other crops that use that. To do that well, we had to fully vertically integrate the whole stack. My investors weren't psyched about that, but my learning as an entrepreneur is, um, it's easy to point to something else in your chain and say, that's why I didn't make it. And I have vertically integrated from wood chips to selling bacon, to producing bacon, to direct store delivery, um, because I want my team to have full agency and success. And if we fail, I wanna know that, you know, we got the wood chips and we couldn't move them all the way to the end. Um, I was able to convince my investors of that. I'm very appreciative of that, but that's a little bit of my own obsession on destiny control. As I mentioned for future factories, we're actually gonna bring mushroom farmers this new industrial crop. We're gonna give them the opportunity to grow something new in their farms that they can make more money at um, and that we can sell as a much higher value product like a bacon. Um, and in that way, we can actually just scale much faster. And again, that both helps, helps capital, like your return on invested capital is faster and it helps the mission which is if it takes me 18 months to build a big factory, that's 18 months that we weren't producing. Okay, so that would cut the time down. Exactly. So that, that is a really great, it's a great example of a business model that when I show that on Wall Street, they're like, oh, I like this business model. Like the money comes back really quickly. And I'm like, I like this business model because like mycelium scales really quickly. So have you, have you sensed investors over the time you've been in the field? Are they getting more comfortable backing infrastructure, mycelium in particular? Uh, Has, there's been a shift? Uh, well, there was, and it's shifting back. So, I mean, I'll just say my belief is I could not do any of the things I'm describing to you if I was starting today. You know, I raised the capital to do that two years ago. Uh, there was a lot of capital available in ZERP times, 0% interest. Uh, the hurdle rate to build new infrastructure at 5.25% federal funds rate is unbelievable. And 
I think there's going to be a massive tension here that was there before when we had low interest rates that's going to get like blown way out in this environment. And I don't know totally how we get through that. I want to talk more about kind of building in a downturn later. Um, but can you talk us through your cap table and perhaps who you've had to go? Because a lot of founders I talk to who are building infrastructure have told me they've had to go to very diverse sources compared yeah. to a software play. Yeah. Um, talk us through who you've gone to and why you've chosen them and how that's worked. I've built significant amounts of new infrastructure twice in my life. Uh, the first was for the mushroom packaging business. Uh, that is a business that is defined by relatively large revenue at a global scale, but in general, like the packaging business is high volume, low margin, and capital intensive. Um, generally not like the darlings, darlings of, the wall, of Wall Street. Um, I funded that by uh, basically having foundations become our largest investors and being a mission-oriented company. And uh, the Dune Foundation, which is the second largest uh, charitable organization in the world after the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, located in the Netherlands, funded by the Postcode Lottery, does a lot of work in climate change, incredible people, over time became my largest shareholder and helped me build those assets, build those teams, and build those factories. Um, to my earlier point over this journey, which we did over seven years, um, I realized that even if I could succeed in doing that, that the packaging we developed was not scaling fast enough in capitalism to have the kind of impact I wanted to have. And, you know, we don't live that long. We're not here that long. And so that is, again, what took me on this journey to, like, what other markets can we tackle? What other markets can we tackle now we've gotten seven years smarter about this technology? And what markets can we tackle where we can do tremendous societal good and make a lot of money for the capitalists? Because... Um, the foundation scaling business plan, you know, was not taking me to scale. Yeah. And so, you know, full disclosure, three years ago, I bought out almost all of my mission-oriented shareholders. I bought them all out on a return, and the business model I just described here is the one I shared with folks on Wall Street, and uh, Viking Global, which is a $40 billion hedge fund, is now my largest shareholder. And they want me to return a bunch of capital, and I want to do a bunch of good, and hopefully we get it right. Do you feel like they are... Are there points of tension between someone like Viking and... Um, I actually feel absolutely no tension because like, I am fully aligned on the idea that the more factories we build or scale, like, the bigger our, our positive environmental at, impact is. And, and we're really serious about LCAs and data around this, uh, both internally and externally. Um, and that if that isn't ha happening, there isn't it's okay either way, right? If the business isn't working, the scale isn't happening, the impact isn't happening. And if it goes the other way, it does. And, and currently it's going the other way. So don't feel tension. And then away from money, which I know is probably the main hurdle at present, but aside from that, what other hurdles do you think the industry is facing and how do we remove the roadblocks? How do we get around them? I don't want to be too depressing. <laughs> um, you know, I, but I'm going to be. I just want to say, I think we're going into a hard 18, 24 months as a group. And I want everyone to be kind to each other, whether you're on the investor side or the entrepreneur side or cheering or not from the sidelines. Um, and I do think it's going to be harder. And I think the thing that should keep all of us going in that environment is uh, remembering that what we're working on is really, really important. It is truly existential in terms of the threat to our planet. Um, and that there will be brighter fields on the other side of this. And for those firms, investors, and companies that pass through this Rubicon, um, I think they'll be at a tremendous opportunity for you know, fresh enthusiasm and fresh capital to help scale innovation. So uh, I would say if you're early stage, like that's phenomenal. You're actually in a really good spot right now. By the time you're getting to like your scaling moment, like you might be in a really great space with the world. And you know, for those of us at the later stage, like, you know, get to profitability. I was going to ask for your advice for very early stage, stage founders. Yeah. That, that, I mean, you've already given some. Any more? I'm sure there are people who'd love to hear. I, I was talking to um, some founders earlier working in Mycelium, and I, I, I'll share what I shared with them, which is uh, there is a ton of activity in the space right now, and that's really exciting. Um, and my experience to win, you really got to stack a bunch of competitive advantages. And so uh, in your early days, I would encourage you to... to Stay flexible and keep being iterative. What is it that my technology or solution does? What is the problem I'm solving? Who is everyone else around me? And is my technology, my team, and my, how am I applying to the problem the best way to do it in comparison to all the other solutions I see around me? Answer maybe no. Don't be afraid of that feeling. Grab onto it. 
That means you got to either change what you're doing or be the best solution. Uh, and that's what I've done over the years, and I, and I don't have time for it today, but like I have failed hundreds of times in this process to find a few areas where we think we have good fits. And so I would just encourage you all to like embrace that and really keep asking yourself that question. And you mentioned team. Are you, I mean, I guess the attraction of, of working in this field and your ability to bring in high-class talent has probably increased over time as the field's grown, but um, how is it at present and which kind of roles are you, do you need? Who, who do you want to join the mycelium world? Uh, we, we, like, we like weird people <laughs> who, think, who think about the world in different ways. Uh, t team is so important and, and I've been really fortunate to build an organization of a, 150 people who are genuinely at Acovative because they believe in what we are doing first and foremost. We, we, pay, we pay market wages. We are not the highest paying employer in our area, but everyone who gets through the door has to really be there for that first principled reason. Um, and I found that's been transformative in sort of aligning the work we do. Um, we are hiring. Uh, we're hiring mostly in the production operator uh, environment right now, though I believe there's some engineering and research scientist roles open as well. Um, and yeah, the amount of talent appearing in the field is wonderful. And from my perspective, we're starting to get to the cycle where folks are cycling through companies. And that's when ecosystems really start to develop. And, you know, you get this like shared knowledge and shared culture uh, transferring around. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And then because you, you've, you've been in the field for a long time, are there any kind of new companies or new subsectors that you think are really exciting and that you're, you're kind of championing? Um, <laughs> well, it's probably clear, but like my, my belief is that biological technology uh, represents the most advanced technology we have access to in general. So not just mycelium, but just in general. Um, and I think there are many more mycelium-like uh, inventions or innovations or natural properties that are, um, you know, hitting, hiding just below the surface. And I think we can find more of those. And I think that is the path to have what still looks like an industrial economy in terms of the experiences we have, uh, but without all the impact. And, you know, some of the things I heard about earlier I found very exciting, like self-healing uh, fabrics based on squid proteins. It's very exciting. And so in the context of, of the downturn, you're, you're hopeful for the field or what do you think will, things will look like in I think I'm defined years, as a, so. a, a pragmatic optimist. So if you ask me what is my 10-year view on the field, I'm very optimistic. This is a mega trend. This is going to happen. Um, we're going to get there. And it's going to be hard. Uh, if you ask me, and I'll speak from my American-centric viewpoint, what is going to happen over the next year in the U.S., like, I think one in three companies in this sector broadly and in the venture sector broadly are going to go bankrupt. You know, it's a look left, look right. One company won't be next to you. Like, that just sucks. But I also think it's a necessary extinction event because I think there's, um, there's a lot of stuff that happened during low interest periods that probably didn't make any sense. And so my belief is it's sort of like a, a, a fitness event that has to occur, but it will make the industry better and stronger and more disciplined and rigorous about actually achieving the goals we've set out to do. Do you have any advice on someone wanting to go into the field on how they can pick one of those companies that uh, will survive? Or what entry points would you pick into the, into the, to the field if you were kind of joining it today? Well, I mean, from the employee perspective, I think that's, <laughs> that's way less important than from the entrepreneur's perspective. Because even if you go work at a company and it doesn't work out and they go under, like, you know, you've gained hopefully valuable experience. And I would encourage folks to really index if you're early in your career uh, to the individuals and humans you'll be working with in that job and the opportunity that might provide you to maximize your learning your self-learning for the career, for the field, for your person. Um, and index less on stock options, salary comp, title, etc. Cool, good advice. I want to hand over to audience questions, um, if we have any. I'm sure we have a lot. Um, I don't know if we've got another mic going around or I can bring you mine. Might be. Thank you. Uh, yes, I had a question about the carbon footprint of mushroom production as like button mushroom, like to grow one kg, you're, like, you're generating about 0 0.7 pounds of carbon dioxide emissions. So have you thought about that? If yes. Yeah. 
yeah, we have done, um, so we just built this giant new farm. Uh, the New York State Pollution Prevention Institute, which is a nonprofit, is conducting a third party LCA on the farm, uh, which will be out later this year. Um, with that said, we would not have built the farm if we didn't think it had an unbelievably positive environmental footprint, right? I'd, I'd actually rather like return capital to my investors and go home and take a nap. Uh, we're somewhere on the order of like one fifth to one tenth the emissions, but it depends hugely on what you were comparing to and how are you drawing the box, right? In your LCA analysis. So my belief is box should be drawn around the entire planet. So cradle to grave, right? Not cradle to gate, not halfway through the analysis. Um, and then even when you do that, you know, you have, like, let's take leather as a, for instance, is leather a byproduct of bovine production? Some people in LCAs take that view and you get a very different carbon accounting perspective. Is it a co-product? Some LCAs take that view. You get a very different carbon accounting. Um, is it a primary product? Because this is a luxury cow that's grown predominantly for its skin. It's a weird situation, but it occurs. Well, then you'd have a different carbon accounting. Um, so I will say that from my view, looking at it holistically from the criteria I just described. We're gonna draw a box around Spaceship Earth. Nothing gets in, nothing gets out. Um, CO2, water, uh, energy, so like megajoules per kilogram, are somewhere between half an order of a magnitude to an order of magnitude better. In general, I'm been making the same comparison to a competitive material in leather or whole cut muscle meat. And I'll give you numbers in like another two months publicly on our website. Uh, and I just want to say, because there's been an LCA going around about this, we do not inject CO2 into our mycelium growth chambers at scale. Mycelium produces CO2, just like all of you in this room. It breathes in oxygen, it digests wood chips, and it releases just a little bit of biogenic CO2. But it's a fraction of what you'd find from like a fossil fuel enabled product. Who else has got a question? I can... Uh... Thank you. Um, you mentioned that the people you work with is extremely important. How do you go about weeding out those people and making sure you choose right? Thanks, Naomi. Uh, it's super hard. Uh, internal to Ecovative, uh, let me answer this two ways, first of all, because there's sort of two ways we work with the world. There's hiring people that work at Ecovative or My Forest Foods. Um, there's like 200 of them. And then we do work with folks around the world. We license technology, we sell raw materials, we're trying to enable this ecosystem. Um, <laughs> you know, within Ecovative, we have very conventional hiring practices. People go through interviews. Um, you know, our values are clear. Uh, and we rely a lot on, I think, having the right talent come to us based on sort of the energy and values we put out in the world. Uh, we run a robust hiring process. And then, you know, I'll be honest, my experience is you can't really figure someone out during an interview process. Some of the people who are best at interviewing are the worst at doing their job, and some of the people who are the best at the jobs who you really want inside your organization just don't interview well. And so um, I try to be generous on the interview screen and, and get people in, and then really see how they perform inside the organization. Um, we have really low turnover at Ecovative, and just you know, most of our turnover, candidly, is like us having to choose to let someone go because they're not fitting in. And it's usually really painful because folks don't want to leave. I have a lot of people celebrating 10 year anniversaries this year. Like that's super rare and that's super rare for a relatively new company. How big is your team now? Uh, the Ecovative team and the MyForest team uh, together uh, are pushing 200. And Ecovative is more like 140. Nice. Um, next question, if anyone's got another one. It's okay if not. Perhaps we, because I don't, we didn't really touch on kind of what's next for Ecovative itself. Could you talk us through the next year? Have your own priorities changed given the economy? Um, what's the plan? Yeah, what, what's shifting around? So, so my, my priority in the coming 18 months or 24 months, and you can, you can all evaluate me on this and publicly shame me on it uh, if I'm not successful, is to reach scale and to reach scale and show that we can produce uh, m these mycelium materials at a positive direct margin in our plants. That's it. That's like, I am myopically focused on achieving this milestone because that is then the pivot point to scale very rapidly and I believe do a lot of good in the world. Um, the current change in the economic environment like really only acts as a forcing function on like wanting to do that even more because whereas before it was the right thing to do, um, we were definitely in an environment where you could miss and probably get a do-over. And, and my sense right now is there can be no failure. There can be no do-overs and there can be 
no mistakes. And uh, it's hard to get it right 52 weeks in a row, but it's yeah. what I think That's we got to do. <laughs> and then we haven't touched on this at all, but what do you, um, in terms of kind of state or government support, is there anything you're pushing for, asking for? I know America's enormous climate bill, does that impact you in any way? Has that shifted your thinking? Ecovative was very fortunate very, very early on in the United States to get the, the support of groups like the SBIR program, which is the Small Business Innovation Research Grant. I think there are similar programs uh, here in the European Union. Uh, those, I think, are really impactful for early stage companies, and I'm a big supporter of those programs. They're no longer as relevant to Ecovative uh, where we're at. Um, I am a big fan of carbon tax. Uh, I'm a big fan of putting a real cost on externalities like plastic. Um, very supportive of those, but I don't personally engage in uh, any lobbying on it. Uh, coming back to that point of like monomaniacal focus on a single objective. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, any more questions at all? Nice. I will. If you had to mention another um, cool uh, pre-seeds uh, or pre-seeds uh, fungi mycelium startup. Obviously, you are the coolest company, but if you have to mention another one, what uh, would it be? So, uh, kind of keeping with the macabre, I was, in the, I was in the Netherlands yesterday at Mushroom Days, which is a cool festival if you've never been to, all about mycelium stuff, mostly conventional mushrooms. Um, one of the companies that was there, which I, I really like, is Loop. Uh, this was started by a gentleman named Bob Hendricks, a design student from the Netherlands, uh, and they make a fully home compostable coffins. And... Uh, a lot of people don't think about the death care industry. I'd never given the death care industry a lot of thought. I try and avoid that thought typically. Um, but apparently it's a market we all participate in. It's a huge market. And a lot of what happens to bodies uh, at the end of life is pretty, pretty gross, pretty toxic, and not what people actually feel is aligned with their values. And so uh, Bob is sort of tapping into this natural burial moment, bringing a new material and a new product with new properties to it. And um, has done so in a way that I think is uh, really spectacular in a lot of ways. So that's what I like. I also love what Joanne is doing at MycoCycle, you know, re doing remediation. And um, I, I don't know, there's like a million cool mycelium startups out there. I, I love it. How do, you, how do you think Europe's doing? I know that's a big question because it's a big place, but um, from an American standpoint, looking across, how, how do you think the fields compare? I actually think Europe has more going on in mycelium specifically. That's my, my, my sense of the market. Um, I think that America has more mycelium companies that have taken a path of like, let's raise a lot of capital, let's be more institutional. Um, you know, obviously I now fit into that mold. I didn't start there. Uh, and in Europe, I see a lot of, uh, I guess what I'm used to being, which is like scrappier early stage startups that are finding solutions in there. And so... Uh, I actually really like that. And from the Ecovative perspective, as it relates to like our, our earlier stage technologies like uh, packaging and composites, like we're working to, to, do, to be way, way more on the open source side and really be more like a raw material provider and getting out of the product ownership side of the equation being more like a support layer for others. Mm -hmm. Someone earlier was saying to me that they've seen in food increasing collaboration more and more amid a downturn. Is that something that you're also yeah. seeing? Is that what you, what you mean? Um, I think that there's, uh, I like the terminology you chose, which is increasing collaboration instead of like forced collaboration um, or forced consolidation. But what I have seen does appear to be that, which is positive, uh, positive collaboration between companies that are trying to find fits. And I think we're also going to see the same, which is like, you know, some forms of forced consolidation where it's like, ah, you know, we don't need that many startups addressing that problem. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Two more questions. I'll run over here. I think we got one. We got one. We got a uh, from Libre over here. Specifically to leather, if you maintain or cared well for leather with leather care products of all kinds, it would last fairly long. Is this also applied to mycelium-based leather, or is it uh, not so relevant because the structures are just so different in any ways last long? This is a really important point, and I think again gets to like the nuances and challenges in the material world and how dangerous sort of like blanket statements. Like, I used to make statements like styrofoam is evil and I re registered toxicwhitestuff.com and like, it's not evil. It actually has some really great uses. Most of them are evil, but like single use is evil, but like there's some good uses. Um, 
a leather bag that's a heritage bag that's going to last 100 years is going to be treated with so many chemicals that you probably shouldn't worry too much about like its origin in that sense, right? It almost becomes a durable, long-lasting thing. Our approach in the sector has been not to make a finished mycelium leather. T two reasons for that. Uh, one, I want to sell a mycelium uh, hide that is pure. There's no plastic in it. There's no additives in it. It comes off the, the farm. We just slice it and dry it, right? That's, uh, that's pure. Uh, two, we can do that better than anyone in the world. It's what we maniacally focus on. Uh, and then three, in my customer discovery conversations, talking to brands that make heritage bags, talking to electronics companies that make sort of maybe shorter life things like phone cases, it turned out that leather does a lot of things for a lot of different people. Um, and that there wasn't a single chemistry solution out there today that was very good, and certainly not a single chemistry solution that would actually solve everyone's needs. And so we partner with brands and tanneries, and some brands and tanneries are going 100% natural, 100% bio-based. This will compost in a year. And some brands are like, ah, I'd like it to be a heritage item. I'm going to put some like the conventional products I use in it and make it last forever. We're willing to support all of those because we're displacing the animal agriculture that occurs before it. And we sort of integrated our business at that stage. Again, this is calibrated to be a business model that drives absolute maximum scale if we are successful in the techno-economic portion of that, right? If I can produce these hides at scale in Europe next year for 10 bucks a square, like there should be lots of flow. And so that business model is designed to support that also. Got it. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I think that once you start working with, with fungi, you get really excited about all the different applications that, that you can, all the different routes you can go. But how do you prevent having like a convoluted narrative in terms of like, hey, I want to do, you know, packaging, I want to make bacon, I want to do all these different things. Because a lot of times, uh, this product versus technology yeah. narrative is, is very tricky, right? But it's like, you really want to develop great technology and really find new things. But at the same time, you need to have something on the market that really attests to, to, to what that is. So I wonder what challenges you had and then maybe how you overcame that uh, and, and what can we learn from, from, from you and Ecoative? That's a really great question. And I'll just start by saying as an entrepreneur, it's very hard to win. Uh, sometimes you talk to venture capitalists and they say, we really, we just like product companies, you know, be, be focused on your single product. And then the next one will be like, you know, we prefer platform companies because there's like rest, less risk, you know, like around it. And you're like, okay. Um, so my first advice is figure out how you can describe the same thing both ways to different people. <laughs> uh, my second advice is um, there are two stages. Like most people, I think most of the challenges we have as societies, we tend to think of things like on a single dimension and like obviously everything's multidimensional. Uh, in this dimension, you have different periods in time where you should be different things. In the beginning, I think you need to be very exploratory. You need to look at everything. Like I said, don't hold on to your ideas. At some point, you got to reach conviction. This is it. You know, we're going to do bacon or we're going to do leather. We're going to do packaging. And then you just got to run as hard as hard as you can and set some stage gates. A board helps with this. Like, let's pick our head up after a quarter. We set a goal. Are we getting there? Why are we not? The KPIs will tell you in the ult ultimately in that process if you're dumb. Um, and then maybe you need to go back and try things again. Uh, I will say I did way too much of the first thing. So I'd say the first seven years of my life, we did a thousand and one things with mycelium. Uh, really cool, and I got 80% of them to the finish line. That doesn't count. Um, in my second act, which has been sort of, I guess, roughly the last seven years I've been working, um, it has really been a really tight focus on like one category or two categories. Um, and now I'm getting the opposite feedback in venture pitches, which is like, oh, like, what are all the other things you can do? And it's like, <laughs> believe me, I have a pitch deck on that. But I won't show you it until we get to full scale in the plant next year. So I, I find that works, but it's absolutely crazy making. It's a good answer. Um, we'll have to leave it there. But are you sticking around for, are you here today, rest of today and tomorrow? I will be here uh, till like 10 o'clock tonight. Okay, cool. So people can catch you and ask questions. Um, great. Thank you. That was useful insights and super inspiring. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you. you all for, for joining.